I'm Greg Whitman. I'm a neurologist by training. I have a long-standing interest in dizziness, vertigo, balance, walking, and falls. And today I'm going to be talking about the management of selected forms of dizziness that I've seen frequently over the years. If you're watching this live and you'd like to type questions in the chat, you can do so and we will answer them at the end of the talk. In this short video, I'm going to be focusing on treatment of dizziness. For those of you who are interested in getting more detail on the approach to diagnosis of dizziness, I can suggest a couple of additional resources. There are two videos on the Hogue Health YouTube channel, the dizziness video and the benign paroxysmal positional vertigo video, which can be found by searching YouTube for Hogue dizziness or Hogue BPPV and these provide more detail on diagnosis of dizziness. I also figured out that portions of a book that I co-authored about dizziness can be read for free on Google Books. But today, the spotlight is going to be on treatment of dizziness. Let's begin with a case. An 80-year-old woman reported that when she rolls over toward her left side in bed, she experiences severe dizziness lasting 10 seconds. She has been less steady on her feet. This is a typical presentation of benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, a condition that typically causes severe positional dizziness, such as um, when lying down in bed, getting out of bed, turning over in bed. And the most severe attacks of dizziness last typically less than 60 seconds. But these same people can also experience other milder forms of dizziness that can happen throughout the day, even when not changing positions. BPPV, as described in more detail in those other videos I mentioned, is caused by a breakdown of the normal <clears throat> motion sensing calcium protein crystals on the utricular macula. The utricle is an organ in the inner ear that senses acceleration. And it has these little ear stones that can break down and uh, particles of which can begin floating around the inner ear fluid. And um, what I'm pointing to in the picture on the right side of the slide is um, the junction of the back semicircular canal, which is kind of coming out of the picture into the right, and, and another canal, the anterior canal, that's going toward the back. And what happens um, in this condition is that the debris and I wish there was a way to point to this, but the, the freely floating debris that um, breaks down from one of these otolith organs like the utricle is like snow in a snow globe. It's these little tiny particles like dust or snow that's floating around in the inner ear. And it settles down to the bottom of one of these semicircular canals, like that one that you can see easily in the foreground of the photo. And once it's trapped at the bottom of that canal where it's trapped, in this example, it's trapped in the posterior semicircular canal, let's say, it doesn't easily come out of that canal. And, and when it sloshes around as the person gets in and out of bed or turns their head, it can cause severe vertigo. What you'd like to be able to do is to twist and turn the head in some clever series of ways to maneuver this freely floating debris out of the semicircular canal and dump it back into the utricle where am I, I'm pointing there in the photo where it can be cleared out of the inner ear. And fortunately, we know how to do this. The bottom half of the figure here shows the um, most widely used and, in my experience, the most effective treatment of this common form of BPPV, the posterior canal form of BPPV. And it, it shows treatment of a patient with a left ear BPPV. Um, the patient is laid down toward the left side, rotated toward the right side, and then sat back up. And as you do this, you're just moving this freely floating debris around the semicircular canal where it's trapped, putting it back into the utricle so that it can be cleared. This often has to be done multiple times over a series of different visits. Sometimes you get lucky and you're all done after one visit. Other times you have to be really persistent and it's important to make sure that the patient is completely free of dizziness for some period of time before you decide that you're all done with treatment. I've seen a lot of people that have been partially treated and then um, went home thinking they might be okay and decided they just had to live with their residual dizziness uh, and then subsequently were treated persistently and they were completely cured and had no symptoms.
One of the things I wanted to mention uh, while focusing on dizziness is that uh, in this condition, the accepted theory is that the, the vertigo is caused by movement of this freely floating debris in a semicircular canal. And I've tried to show what that might be like with this figure at the top right showing a, that red material that's kind of settling like snow in a snow globe. That's kind of what it, we think it's like most of the time. But sometimes um, patients are not easily uh, cured of this condition, and we think that that might be because the debris gets um, jammed or, or stuck in the, in the canal, and it doesn't flow so freely. And uh, there's this idea that maybe you could um, break it up and loosen things up and get it to be more freely floating by applying some vibration. And so at the bottom, there's this case report from a physical therapist and others that reported um, just putting a little bit of vibration on the uh, skull and back of the ear over the mastoid bone and um, converting a patient who was impossible to cure into one who was subsequently cured after mastoid vibration and uh, repositioning maneuvers like an Apley maneuver. And, and this has um, been borne out in my experience as well. This is a kind of trick that's not well supported by the um, medical literature, uh, but people who treat this condition routinely know about it as an option. And I, I've certainly seen patients where I, I've converted a, a patient who's having a very hard time and, and who I could, for whom I could not get the vertigo to go away into someone who it, it went away very easily. And one of the reasons I think that this works is that I, I think that um, my observations check with the idea of the debris being stuck in the canal, and I'll, I'll tell you why. So typically in BPPV, when a patient lies down toward the affected ear, uh, what happens is there's a delay of some number of seconds. Uh, there's a, what's called a latency, a brief delay. And then there's this burst of vertigo and eye movements that can be recognized. That latency is typically a few seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds. Um, but there are some patients for whom it's much longer. It's at 20 seconds, 30 seconds. And, and often those are the patients um, who are much harder to cure with these repositioning maneuvers. And in such patients, um, I've had the experience of putting a little bit of vibration over the back of the skull behind the ear again, just you know, a few seconds with a neck massager or something, just bzz, 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 bzz. And, and then at, upon testing the patient again, the latency was now very short. So where the latency from lying down to eye movements and vertigo was 25 seconds, now it was five seconds, something more as you usually expect. And, and, and then it was possible to treat the patient effectively. This doesn't come up all the time. I would say it maybe several times a year or less. So, it, it, but it's a good um, uh, sort of trick to have uh, available. I'll keep the neck massager in my little black bag in the, the exam room, and I'll take it out from time to time and, and try it. Something to keep in mind it, for those situations where doctors have been trying to treat this and, and it found it impossible to cure. Another thing to point out, you may have heard um, someone talk about the so-called log roll maneuver. So I, I talked about the Epley maneuver briefly. There's an alternative to that called the log roll maneuver. And that's um, supposed to be uh, alluding to uh, um, a, a comparing the maneuver to the situation of a, a log rolling uh, in water as it floats on top of the water. And this is a maneuver that we use if the debris is trapped not in the posterior canal, but instead in the horizontal semicircular canal. And so that's what's meant to be shown in that upper left picture. I'm pointing to that horizontal canal. And um, if, if the debris is in that canal, what you'd like to do is to turn the patient um, in such a way that you move the debris around the horizontal canal and again, put it back into the, the utricle where the debris can be um, cleared. And I, I can't point to the picture, but maybe you can appreciate that in, in this photo, which shows the position of the inner ear in a patient who's upright, sitting or standing, that, that horizontal canal um, has a plane that's parallel to the ground. But it, if you lie the patient down so that you're flipping the canal up 90 degrees, um, now you've got a situation that, that's similar to looking at the cut face of a log floating on top of water. And if, if you spin that canal around, um, that's how you move the debris around the canal. And so what you do in the clinic is you simply uh, have the patient's head turn to one side while they're lying down, turn toward the middle and then toward the opposite side, and then you continue turning the patient around so that they are lying on their stomach, 
continue to turn so that they ultimately make a 360 degree revolution. And you do this a couple few times and then do it every so often. The, the exact protocol varies on uh, based on individual considerations. But um, for BPV treatment in general, I, I um, would typically treat people uh, once with a, at least a couple of maneuvers and then give it a couple of days so that whatever debris you did get out of the semicircular canals has time to get cleared out of the chamber where you put it and then maybe revisit with more testing and, and more treatment 48 hours after the first treatment. There's no hard and fast rules with that. I think the exact protocol kind of has to be individualized. Another thing I wanted to mention about treatment of BPPV is that there's this post-BPPV syndrome. And um, this is a syndrome where um, you've successfully gotten rid of the real severe vertigo, successfully gotten rid of the eye movements that you can see on examination, but yet the patient still doesn't feel quite right. It maybe is a little lightheaded, slightly off balance. And physiology studies have suggested that the uh, reflex that's mediated by the utricle where this debris that comes from, that, that this utricle mediates a reflex that keeps the eyes um, stable on what you're looking at when, when the head is tilted, that that reflex can be shown to be weak uh, in people that have BPPV, and that may affect balance. So in practical terms, um, what I do is send patients to physical therapy to retrain the balance system, and ideally with a vestibular physical therapist that essentially just means someone that has a special interest in physical therapy for people with balance and dizziness. And most communities or regions have a small number of physical therapists that have that as a special interest. This post-BPPV syndrome has a duration that um, varies by age is what I've found, is that for older people, it, it can be in the range of months. For, for younger people, it's typically more in the range of days to weeks, but it, it's there and it gradually goes away. So it, if uh, the patient continues to be somewhat lightheaded and off balance despite uh, resolution of the eye movements and the severe positional vertigo, uh, it's not necessarily the case that there's some second diagnosis going on. Although one of the reasons I follow up on patients with BPV is I want to make sure that there is not some additional cause of dizziness because there are so many causes of dizziness. Uh, but it could be that there's just residual dizziness on, on this basis of the post-BPPV syndrome. Let's look at another case. A 60-year-old man with chronic right-sided hearing loss reported that he has had three severe prolonged episodes of spinning vertigo lasting approximately one hour. During attacks, his right ear hearing gets worse. This is a typical presentation of Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease is an um, inner ear disease of unknown cause. Uh, it um, causes fluctuating hearing loss that involves low-pitched sound. It typically involves one ear more than the other. And it causes these attacks of severe vertigo, typically described as whirling or spinning, often with a lot of nausea, sometimes vomiting, imbalance, difficulty walking. And if you do a hearing test, you'll see um, fluctuating low-pitched sound hearing loss that, that's typical for involvement of um, the inner ear. And it's, it's fluctuating early in the course of this disease. So once um, somebody's had this for several years, the, the hearing loss may be more stable and, and abnormal. Oftentimes with the attacks, um, patients will also have a, a feeling of fullness of the ear. Um, sometimes there'll be a, a change in baseline tinnitus, so oftentimes people with hearing loss do have tinnitus, or they hear a sound in the ear with the hearing loss, and that tinnitus may change uh, before the onset of the attack. Um, the bottom of the, the screen is just showing a typical audiogram. Um, basically, if, if you focus on the left uh, grid there, there there's um, the horizontal axis has um, the frequency of sound. So what the audiologists do is they present sounds, tones of, of varying pitch, and, and then the vertical axis shows how loud do they have to make the sound so the patient can hear it and push a button or say, yes, I hear it. And what that's meant to show that graph down there is that in, in this ear, that the left-hand side of the bottom of the screen is one particular ear. Uh, for the lower pitch sound, they had to make it very loud for the patient to hear it. That's all that's supposed to show. And that's a typical Meniere's type pattern of hearing uh, loss. So without getting too into the diagnosis, that, that's our main test or, or one of the best tests for Meniere's is a hearing test. Treatment of Meniere's disease is challenging. So 
I'll tell you about my experience. Um, the, so the mainstay of treatment of Meniere's disease with, let's say, oral medications, um, uh, leaving aside surgery for the moment, treat, treatment with um, non-surgical options, it has historically been uh, management of dietary sodium consumption and the use of diuretic or water pill medications. And, and that's, what, as a non-surgeon, that's, that's what I've mostly done over the years. I, I do find that uh, diuretic medications appear to be effective for a lot of patients. The um, evidence base for effectiveness is not great in the medical literature, um, but having treated a lot of patients with Meniere's, I'm convinced that it appears to work, at least for a lot of people. And um, salt restriction also is helpful for some patients. So I'll, I'll tell you my approach to salt restriction. I think the typical routine for a lot of people to treat Meniere's disease is to tell the patient, um, keep your average daily sodium consumption under some number, like 2,000 milligrams of sodium per day. And I think that's a reasonable thing to try. But it's also important to smooth out the consumption of dietary sodium over the course of each day. So the patient who doesn't take much sodium all day and then has a big salty meal for dinner is, in my experience, more likely to develop a vertigo attack than the patient who takes 2,000 milligrams a day but smooths out, the, spreads out the sodium consumption over the whole day. Drinking some water throughout the day also appears to be an effective strategy and may reduce the number of vertigo attacks. There's actually a clinical trial about that that reported effectiveness, but it, it checks with my experience as well. So that's something about dietary sodium consumption. I guess I could talk about also the details of, of um, how you implement the sodium con restriction. <laughs> So I, in my mind, the, the dietary sodium restriction, it, it's, it needs to be adjusted sometimes, and it's similar to adjustment of the dose of medication. So I try to get patients to spend several days adding up the number of milligrams of sodium they, that they think that they're getting per day on average by reading um, labels of packages that tell you it's sodium and where necessary searching the internet for sodium uh, content of different foods to try to get an estimate. And, and then once the patient knows what their baseline average sodium consumption is per day, then you can begin to adjust it. You can say, okay, well, let's try to get rid of 500 milligrams a day of sodium and see how that goes. And the problem, I guess, is that there, there's not that far down to adjust. So I, probably the smoothing out sodium consumption is, is maybe even more powerful than the incremental adjustment of total sodium that, that I just talked about. And then diuretics. So um, I do think there's a large subset of, of patients with Meniere's that respond to diuretics, um, that these are medicines that get rid of sodium and water. How they work is somewhat uncertain, um, but um, they, they do seem to work. So what, what I'm showing on the screen there is the guidelines that have been promulgated by the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery is the, I think, the largest American professional organization for ear, nose, and throat doctors. And what they say near the top of the diagram there is that kind of the first, that the first thing you should do is to educate patients about um, diet. And um, so that's what we talked about. And then if that doesn't work, then you can consider diuretics. And then further down on the flow sheet, what they say is if the diuretic medications don't work, then you can offer something called intratympanic um, corticosteroid injection. And that's something I don't do. I'm not a surgeon, but the ear surgeons are able to inject an anti-inflammatory corticosteroid medication through the anesthetized eardrum into the middle ear, and then it gets leeches into the inner ear, we think, and, and cuts down inflammation. That, that seems to be um, very effective in, in some patients. Again, there's not a great evidence base of randomized clinical trials to, to support that, but my experience suggests it does work in, in many people. And then further down in the list is the more invasive treatment. So, the ear surgeons can and sometimes do inject gentamicin, which is an antibiotic that we know damages the inner ear balance structures. And, and the idea there is to intentionally damage the inner ear balance function so that the inner ear stops firing off inappropriately and causing these terrible vertigo episodes. And that, that's um, you know, getting to be a little bit more of a last resort option. I, I've um, referred people for that mainly um, where they are having uh, just severe and tractable um, episodes that despite a, a increase in the dose of diuretics or sometimes changing diuretics, I'll, I'll try a few different things 
you know, before I send somebody to inject something that's going to damage the inner ear. The, the one case where I would refer people more quickly for intra intratympanic genomycin is if people have this thing called otolithic, otolithic crises. And, and this is a, a situation where a Meniere's patient has these very sudden attacks where it, it's, it's as though some unseen force uh, has just thrown the patient to the ground. And, and you can imagine that could be very dangerous if, if someone is driving or they're, um, they could fall into the street or something. So when people have those kind of crises that are just um, sudden and very severe, then it, it makes sense to do something that, that's going to have a, a reliable effect. It, IT genomycin, uh, as I just described, it is pretty effective in, in stopping these vertigo episodes. That, so if, you, if we need it, we use it. And then at the bottom of the um, flow sheet there are the surgeries, that cutting the balanced nerve or even um, taking out the, the whole inner ear if there's no functional hearing. Those are really last resort options that are uh, for people with, you know, it's, it's for the, for the one or two percent or some low single digit percent of patients with Meniere's. For, for most patients, for 90 plus percent of patients with Meniere's disease, we can get adequate control um, over a pretty short time frame of uh, months. Let's look at another case. A 25 year old man has episodes of dizziness that last 20 minutes and often lead into a headache with a perception that lights are extremely bright. This is a typical presentation of migraine. To make this diagnosis, you should uh, be able to diagnose the patient with migraine usually, which means that you have at least a suspicion that over the course of the person's life, they've had some episodes of headache combined with nausea or headache combined with uh, excessive light and sound sensitivity. That, that's migraine. If the patient with migraine also has attacks of dizziness, then you've gone a long way toward building a case for what we call vestibular migraine. It essentially just means dizziness caused by migraine. And um, there are uh, medications that we use for treatment of migraine headache, and most of those can also be applied to the situation of dizziness caused by migraine. And that's something that needs to be individualized in consultation with a physician. But just know that there are uh, several different classes of medications we use for migraine headaches, and those same meds generally apply to migraine-related dizziness. I wanted to emphasize, though, because it's something that patients can do independently, that there are non-drug approaches to migraine, including vestibular migraine. And that's things like getting regular sleep at night, eating regular nutritious meals, not getting too hungry or thirsty, drinking enough fluids, um, remaining active between episodes when you're feeling well, managing stress effectively, sometimes with things like meditation or yoga, not getting overheated. These are all things that patients can work on uh, independently. There are food triggers. I, I'm not a big advocate of these exhaustive lists of 100 foods that migraine patients you know, must avoid because the, the truth is that uh, generally if people have food triggers, there's a small handful of triggers. Maybe it's excessive caffeine or red wine or MSG for particular patients, but um, it, it's not usually the case that patients, an individual patient usually doesn't need to eliminate 100 different foods. And if they do, they may be uh, limiting their nutrition, and nutrition is so important for migraine. So I think it's maybe a more effective strategy to, to keep a diary of um, what a patient has um, consumed on days when they don't feel as well and try to figure out whether there are some particular situations or, or foods that uh, are associated with more problems in the individual patient. Important to know that BPPV, which we talked about, can aggravate migraines. So if there's an uptick in migraine symptoms, including migraine dizziness, it's good to think about whether there might be an underlying BPPV that needs to be treated. Sleep apnea can aggravate migraine. That often goes untreated, and there is a treatment with continuous positive airway pressure machines. Um, dysautonomia, which uh, we'll talk in, in a minute, that has to do with variable blood flow to the brain or variable blood pressure. That can aggravate migraine. And um, migraine and Meniere's often go hand in hand, so uh, I often see people that have both, and it, it can be challenging to figure out which one to treat first. I like to add one medication or one treatment at a time, but sometimes you have to treat both, um, migraine and Meniere's concurrently. Let's look at another case. A 38-year-old man develops continuous relentless, relentless vertigo, nausea, and inability to walk persisting for 24 hours, at which time his physician knows, notes involuntary eye movements described as both eyes continuously jerking toward his left side. This is a typical presentation of acute vestibular neuritis, which is a condition where there's inflammation of the vestibular nerve that goes from the inner ear to the brain. 
first few days are very incapacitating. Um, and during the first week, it's reasonable to give medications to try to suppress especially the nausea and some of the dizziness, like things like meclizine um, and other medications. So, but it's important to try to get patients off of these tranquilizing medications, the meclizines and dimethyldrenate and any of the azepams, lorazepam. It's important to try to stop those things if you can as soon as possible, like within the first week, so that people can begin to recover and the brain can begin to compensate for uh, differing signals from the right and left ear. Physical therapy plays uh, an important role in recovery from vestibular neuritis. And um, individualized use of um, oral corticosteroid medications, it, I believe, is, is justified. It, again, there's not a, an extensive evidence base of randomized clinical trials for this. But I think people that treat acute vestibular neuritis generally agree that, at least for some patients, they, if nothing else, it seems to shorten the course of the severe symptoms. So, the, the patients uh, get out of that early period of feeling really miserable faster. In the United States, doctors tend to use prednisone. In Europe, it's more methylprednisolone. And the use needs to be individualized and account for potential side effects. The, the duration of therapy is typically between one and three weeks. But it, again, it, you have to develop an individualized plan that accounts for risks and benefits. All right, I think this is the last case, 50-year-old woman with dizziness. Um, with, oh, actually it's the second to last case. She has uh, attacks that are very brief, lasting seconds. I just wanted to make a note about this somewhat rare condition um, which causes very brief uh, attacks of dizziness that happen the same way over and over, lasting seconds. Uh, tests tend to be all negative and sometimes it's due to this thing called vestibular paroxysmia and although this is another somewhat rare one that doesn't come up every day, it's also one where it's been very satisfying to treat some of these patients with this drug called oxcarbazepine, uh, which can be very effective in, in these situations. So just something to keep on the list if, you, if uh, you're not getting to a diagnosis and your episodes of dizziness are ultra short, like 10 seconds or maybe combined with some hearing symptoms. Okay, maybe this is the last case. 69-year-old woman with lightheadedness when she stands up from a chair and associated balance problems that come and go. The autonomic nervous system is um, this set of nervous system structures and functions that regulate all the automatic stuff like heart rate, blood pressure, breathing, digestion, blood flow, uh, blood vessel constriction. And disorders of, of this part of the nervous system can cause a lot of dizziness and imbalance and cognitive impairment. The classic um, version of this is so-called orthostatic hypotension, where a patient stands up and the systolic blood pressure drops by at least 20 millimeters of mercury. But there could be other forms that are less easy to diagnose. This is a huge topic because the, these parts of the nervous system that are involved can be uh, disturbed by many different disorders. Vitamin B12 deficiency is a relatively common and treatable one that, uh, for which we're always on the lookout, along with thyroid problems and sleep apnea. But um, this requires a, a thorough workup. And the, the reason, uh, the, the way we recognize this typically is that when a person rises from a chair or stands, in, stands motionless in one place for a period of a few minutes, they begin to feel lightheaded, vis vision may become a little blurred, the person may not feel attentive. And um, treatment, um, the, the first things we do are tell people to drink enough fluids. If there's no reason they can't have fluids, to try to really tank up on several glasses of water per day. Uh, look at the medication list to see if any of the medications that are being taken may aggravate orthostatic hypotension or aggravate dysautonomia. And to pay attention to the diastolic blood pressure. So you might know the cardiac cycle has a, has a uh, has systole where the heart is contracting and then diastole where the heart's relaxing and the the blood pressure has the top number and the bottom number right and everybody pays the most attention it seems to the top number the systolic pressure but a, a lot of the cardiac cycle is that bottom number the diastolic pressure and if your diastolic pressure is very low like 50 you may not be getting enough blood to your brain during diastole so that's just uh, something that i find is often overlooked in practice that to make sure that the bottom number is something that everybody is paying attention to. Okay, so I guess we're going to switch over to the question and answer portion of this uh, talk. And if there are no questions, thank you very much for tuning in.